Hey, Aloha Friday, and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Cantelmo. Today's episode is dedicated to anyone who has been, is, or will be impacted by AIDS HIV. As of 2016, 36.7 million people were living with HIV in the world. In 1988, the World Health Organization established the World AIDS Day to provide governments, national AIDS programs, community organizations, and individuals with an opportunity to raise awareness and focus attention on the AIDS epidemic. This year's campaign theme is Right to Health, highlighting the need for all 36.7 million people living with HIV to have access to universal health insurance so that they can receive ongoing treatment, follow-up care, and also have access to medication without delay. I cannot think of a more special guest to have this afternoon than Scott Poster. Scott is a Renaissance man who has dedicated so much energy and time of his life to AIDS awareness in the state of Hawaii and also on the mainland. Scott organized the first World AIDS Day events in the state of Hawaii. And for five years, he was the volunteer state coordinator and produced a day without art. He also made sure that with the help of some stronger lights at the state capitol and the Aloha Tower lights were turned off to highlight attention to World AIDS Day. Scott, Scott was also involved with the AIDS Group Memorial. He co-founded one of the first state chapters for the organization that manages the AIDS Memorial Quilt the NAMES Project Foundation. The quilt is displayed in over 1,000 venues annually, and it weighs more than 54 tons, and it has 45,000 panels dedicated to more than 99,000 people who have lost their lives to their, this epidemic. And on that note, thank you so much for having you here on the program. Such an honor. <laughs> Beatrice, it's my honor. It's a great pleasure to be here. So, here we are, 2017. And uh, um, World AIDS Day, which for many people who are living with this epidemic, it's every day. But we have one day a year to highlight you know, uh, their needs and also do more education and awareness building, you know, not only on the epidemic itself, but also the need that we have to come together to support uh, our brothers and sisters who are afflicted by it and their loved ones as well. So we never can stress enough that this is an illness that impacts so many people, not just the person who's directly infected by it. So to give us uh, our viewers a perspective, what, what was it like before World AIDS Day, before 1988? What is your recollection? What was happening? In Hawaii, what was happening in this country? What was happening with the LGBT community? What was happening with your friends? Wow. Okay. It's a loaded question, isn't 1984 it? 1984 <laughs> was when it first came across my radar. I was living in my home state of Oklahoma. Uh, we were very active. Uh, we had quite an active LGBT community in Oklahoma uh, because the uh, so much had happened uh, nationally. The, uh, uh, the women's movement, the black civil rights movement, uh, the LGBT community was organizing. Uh, we were all under attack, and it just all seemed to come together with the social revolution of the, the late 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, were, we were prepared uh, on a political side in Oklahoma uh, uh, to deal with almost anything we thought. And then came AIDS. And uh, uh, the com because the community was organized there, and I was one of the founders of the first uh, uh, political organization in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Now, this is in the 70s. Uh, the Anita Bryant campaign, Harvey Milk was assassinated. Uh, all those horrible uh, riots were taking place. It was a very tumultuous time. So when AIDS hit, it took us all oh, blindsided. God, us. Yeah. Uh, long story short, I moved to Los Angeles for two years in 85, I guess it was. And uh, that was not a happy place to be because, uh, of course, AIDS it was a terminal diagnosis. There was, mm -hmm. uh, and, and quickly, there were no drugs. They didn't know what to do, how to deal with it. And uh, I, I, I just had to get out of Los Angeles. I, didn't, I didn't, couldn't be there. 
So I, a friend of mine suggested I try Honolulu. So I came to Honolulu. Oh, lucky for us. <laughs> and only to find out that there was no LGBT organization here to speak of. There was a tiny, tiny little, uh, uh, it was called the Gay Community Center, and uh, a handful of people who were grappling with the tsunami of problems that the revelations about AIDS was bringing. So what were kind of the um, highlights back in the day, you know, when AIDS came out, and what were the things that were being talked about it in this community? In well, that was the problem. They weren't being talked about. Really? Now, there, there were some, uh, the Life Foundation had been founded a couple of years before I got here, mm -hmm. and they were doing great work. But uh, uh, to their credit, uh, they did not promote the fact that it was mostly gay men that had put it together, and certainly a lot of women uh, later on, but it was never considered uh, a, a gay organization, a gay mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had uh, the latitude to sort of begin to speak on the issue with more clarity than was being done here. Mm -hmm. I was able to help amplify that uh, by by founding the Hawaii Gay Community News, and that's when I began writing seriously about the issue here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, many people are surprised to learn that I've forgotten his name, but uh, the editor of the I believe it was the I don't know it was the Advertiser or the Star Bulletin. In those days, they were separate newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, died of AIDS uh, way back in the day, and and. While that created a sense of urgency, it was not talked about much after he did pass. So the Gay Community News became really the voice of, of uh, the community about AIDS issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's so interesting you mentioning that, is that I grew up, uh, um, most of my formative years were spent in Brazil. So 80s, I was a young teenager, and uh, um, also, the same secrecy, uh, the same lack uh, of information, and uh, when somebody would die of uh, the disease, the stigma was so strong oh, yes, it was. that you know people would go through great lengths to describe the health complications, but never attach the name to the right. actual diagnosis. And the health complications were myriad. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, they were. Dozens mm -hmm. of complications, exactly. and and that was part of the problem, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, and so I mean, not only people struggle to understand the illness itself, but also having to deal with that stigma. And when you had someone uh, that was close to you, whether a coworker, family member, or a friend, uh, who was uh, infected with the virus and then developed AIDS, it, it was even worse. Uh, in Brazil, for example, many family members would completely disown uh, their family members who was actually uh, struggling with HIV AIDS. And uh, when I started college in Brazil in, in 1990, uh, so I was a medical student, and in the first year, the university uh, hospital that I, you know, took my classes at, they were going to close their HIV AIDS. Uh, department because mm. they didn't have funding. We would defund it. And so we had all of these patients who were quite terminal and no place to send them. Well, it was to. just a straight disease. It was yeah. not a straight disease. Yeah. That that was the big misconception from day one, that yeah. it was a gay yeah. disease. And that so later on a lot more of their awareness got built on, but you know, you really see the stigma and that really impacted me very strongly because uh, it took the love and the care of the students and staff members to actually keep that, you know, department functioning. Like we would bring food, we would bring our uh, linens, we would actually donate our time to be there with people at their last months of their lives because they didn't have a place to go. Uh, we felt it was important that they would provide it basic medical care, but also dignity. And, uh, and so to me, it's like, you know, it was a very powerful, you know, experience. And but I think of people who were not, you know, born or who do not remember, you know, how this started. You know, well, how how different it is nowadays. We had no role models. 
no no gay role role model. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, Liberace died, uh, he had denied that he had AIDS from till the end. Mm -hmm. Rock Hudson denied he had AIDS till the very end, and I don't think either one of them ever stepped up and said, mm -hmm. "I have AIDS. Be careful." Mm -hmm. uh, when Magic Johnson came out positive, that was that was when the game changed. Because he, uh, of course, was loved and famous because of his basketball skills. Mm -hmm. And for him to come out positive, it changed the whole game. All of a sudden, people realized, oh, this isn't a gay disease. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Magic Johnson's gay. Well, <laughs> Does it, really make it doesn't really matter. Yes. But it, did, it, it allowed me to, after 10 years, to step away from it. In fact, I wrote in the newspaper... If the straight community doesn't get it now, they never will. I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. And I had to get back to my life because I had given literally 10 years, a full decade of my life, to raising the awareness. So here in Hawaii, when you moved here, you found that you were calling out of need, really, because mm. there was not much of a foundation to really support local people and people who adopted Hawaii as home also. Um, and uh, so what was it like, you know, like the very first years of World AIDS uh, Day, you know, for Hawaii? Because I think it's very important to think from a local perspective. Uh, did people embrace it? By, you know? by then, uh, the world had changed. Uh, and AIDS was much better understood. And again, we had the Life Foundation. Uh, Hawaii had done some rather amazing things. There was the, uh, uh, the Governor's Committee on AIDS under Governor John Waihe, Ae, and uh, uh, which was rather special. Uh, that that was unusual that a, a governor was taking the lead, and out of that came, uh, and I was very pleased to be involved in passing the the needle exchange program, the Hawaii Needle Exchange mm -hmm. Program and uh, working with uh, uh, several of the people that I went on through the years working with uh, World AIDS Day, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, Pam Lichty was, was one of those great people. Uh, there were several others. And so from that hooey of people, when World AIDS Day was announced initially, I, I was still writing for the, uh, publishing the Gay Community News. So I had the mechanism to promote it and by then we had the media relations relationships who were talking about it, so it was it was easy to do uh, because we have the, had those leaders in place, uh, uh, turning the light out on the Capitol, lights out on the Capitol, and Aloha Tower. Uh, I didn't have to do that. I just just call and I'll think of the lady's name in a minute, uh, and she worked in government and she arranged that. Uh, someone else. Uh, we met once or twice on it. A night, a day without art mm -hmm. was another part of that. And uh, we had many art galleries throughout all of Hawaii who either took pictures out of frames and left the frame and uh, put in the banner a day without art or draped black uh, material uh, a day without art just mm -hmm. to imagine, try to, to force people to imagine that all, all of the great entertainers and artists who AIDS was taking, Alvin Ailey, the great founder of the great Alvin Ailey dancers, the mm -hmm. magnificent black dance troupe that still goes on today, uh, uh, he died. So many of, of the artists and, and uh, uh, dancers and singers and Broadway stars were dying. Rudolf Nureyev. Mm -hmm. uh, so by then, it was easy to publicize, and uh, it, it took off. I did it for five years, and uh, we built it from just a small commemoration to what it, it was. It was a real event, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the news covered it and all of that stuff. Yeah. So it started small and... Uh, yeah, but it, it was easy because we had come through all the rest of it and set up the groundwork for it. And now, I, you know, World AIDS Day for me, I will be going, and, and uh, as I told you, you're going to join me tonight at 6.30. I, 
uh, 6.30 at St. Andrew's Cathedral is the annual World AIDS, AIDS Day commemoration. And uh, it's, it's, it's a day that I really look forward to because I will see a lot of those people that have been involved all along. Mm -hmm. and, but the cathedral fills up with people there to remember their loved ones. Loved ones. And that's why mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, and aunts. Neighbors, yeah. So there's a there's a spiritual coming together there that takes place on no other time or place for me, mm -hmm. because uh, it's a day of remembrance, and uh, certainly a day to honor all of those people who contributed to what it is today, which is absolutely education. So we're going to take a quick break. Be right back. I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps him from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii program. This is your host, Beatrice Gantamo, and we are back with Scott Foster. So, Scott, um, we had a, a very beautiful uh, assembling of uh, pictures uh, that we're going to show to our viewers. And I would like if you could give us a historical background of what these quilts were like and how they got started and your role. Uh, to not only have one of the first chapters in the nation to assemble and display these quilts and also helping with the very first exhibit in Washington, D.C. So, Rob, can we see the first picture? Look at that, how marvelous. <laughs> That's, uh, of course, on, on the mall, uh, that the quilt was covered completely from the Capitol building to the street that uh, separates uh, the mall from uh, uh, the, the beginning of the Lincoln Memorial. It was to see that that day, and I was there, uh, the quilt was been displayed, I believe, four times in Washington. I was there for three of the four presentations. Uh, from, for it to grow to that just in a few years, five years maybe, uh, was astounding, and of course we had a display here in Hawaii too. We were the first state in the nation to actually display the quilt, and uh, it was at the Blaisdell uh, Exhibition Hall, and uh, uh, an amazing experience just being involved in it. Uh, I first heard about the quilt when Cleve Jones from San Francisco. Now Cleve Jones was was a close uh, ally and uh, uh, Harvey Milk's staff. So when Harvey was killed, uh, that was long before the AIDS epidemic, uh, pandemic, uh, Cleve had, had tried to memorialize some of his friends who had died of AIDS with cardboard, pieces of cardboard that they put up on a wall. And it occurred to him, the quilt project came from that. From that. And so then the, the, the quilt project began uh, maybe a year, 18 months later. Uh, several of us heard about it in Hawaii. We thought how great it would be to bring it here. Uh, the neat part about it was it didn't cost us any money because uh, uh, I've forgotten which airline volunteered to have their stewards bring the quilt over from San Francisco 
in duffel bags. Oh, how wonderful. So every airline and employee, and forgive me for not remain, reminding, remain, remembering the airline, but uh, that's how the quilt got here and back. And, and at that time, it filled the Blaisdell uh, Hall. Uh, not, it's not, not a small hall. <laughs> well, not the arena, the, hall, the, the, the building hall. between the, the uh, theater and, mm -hmm. and the, the round part. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was filled, and, and of course, we didn't know whether people were going to come or not. Mm -hmm. You always worry about that. And so what was it like? Did people come and respond oh, to the... Oh, that was, that was the great memory for me, was seeing... It was over 10,000 people came, and we, we just had it there for, for, for a day, really. And uh, there were, I guess what's most memorable, it wasn't, of course there were gay people there, but it was mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts and uh, young couples with children and strollers, they all came. Mm -hmm. there, I, I couldn't even begin to, to tell you how thrilling that was. And I remember just standing back thinking, whew, thank goodness it, they're coming. <laughs> so the quilt worked its magic in Hawaii as it done everywhere it's been displayed right. and it is pure magic just just seeing it and of course a lot of uh, we also made quilts here for people and mm -hmm. and during that exhibition I think it, I think we added 40 quilts could be wrong but 40 quilts here and then throughout the next few years I've forgotten how many uh, my close friend the late Tommy Aguilar we made a quilt for Tommy Tommy was an original member of a chorus line, mm -hmm. the Broadway cast of a chorus line, mm -hmm. and Tommy died of AIDS, another artist we lost here. Uh, but uh, A lot of love went into the making of that quilt. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And See, left it, in stories and tears. Uh, we, there was one that stands out, and I've, I've forgotten his name, but the director of the Hawaii Children's Youth Theater had died of AIDS. And his staff and volunteers called me and said, is there time to do it? We had like two days, and we jumped on that. <laughs> and between that, yeah. his staff and his people, what they brought mm -hmm. to it, uh, we had a beautiful quilt for him that joined the, joined the National Quilt. And I think that like, to see how this project you know, has started the love and care of one person who lost loved ones grow to the point where I think it's the it's the largest folk art project, living art project in the world to this day, and it keeps being added on. So on the one hand, uh, you know, it's amazing that we have uh, such a powerful uh, way to honor, you know, our loved ones who you know, died of AIDS. On the other hand, it also is such a brutal reminder of how much oh, work yes. we have to do <clears throat> still, not only in terms of education and awareness and prevention, and hopefully eradication of this illness. I hope to see the quilt come back here on a World AIDS Day, not all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a composer, John Corgliano, who wrote uh, 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 The Ghost of Versailles. Do you remember that opera? It was one of the first new operas to be produced at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, the Ghost of Versailles. He wrote a symphony dedicated to the quilt, the Corgliano Symphony Number. No. I'm going to say one, I think it was. And we had the second premiere of that symphony here with the Honolulu Symphony. And we brought parts of the quilt over for that. Now, uh, I look forward, and, and I'm going to try to encourage uh, uh, the Life Foundation, maybe next year, to do a little more. Uh, uh, it's a volunteer organization with you know funding problems, you know, mm -hmm. trying, trying to raise money to do their work. Yes. But uh, <clears throat> I hope to, to somehow help them get a budget to either do the Corgliano Symphony again or at least bring part of the quilt back. Yeah, well, maybe part of the idea is to see if we can get the symphony uh, donate uh, that proceeds not only to the Life Foundation, who actually lost a lot of funding to do their work uh, 
in these upcoming years, but especially this year. Well, uh, and all these things can be done. It just takes volunteers and time yes, and, yes. and uh, to, to re re-energize it a little so, bit. So because you, not, you have a good invitation and, uh, <laughs> and one volunteer. I know. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully we can get We'll meet some people guys. tonight and tonight is, is uh, December 1 by the way for anyone watching this after the broadcast uh, and this event is tonight December 1 uh, 2017 at the uh, uh, St. Andrew's, Saint, Saint Andrew's Cathedral at 630 and uh, let's, let's reiterate that uh, if you have any relationship with anything we've been discussing, try attend tonight. Absolutely. And even if you don't, you know, for the name of care and, and uh, uh, compassion and humanness, you know, I think one of the things that distinguishes us from any other species on the planet is that we have this innate ability but maximize you know to show care and to mobilize in amazing ways to make things happen to uh, go from a place of utter suffering to a place of healing and 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 transformation and so that is part uh, you know of what we can set as an intention right here today, and let's see if the next year on uh, World AIDS Day we can have uh, the symphony and part of the quilt uh, and our community a little bit more, you know, engaged in this process. So, Robert, before we end our program, do you mind showing uh, a few more pictures of uh, this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful project? That was a postcard. It's so powerful. Yeah, that's my favorite. That, that gives gives a scale. Yes, well, look at that. So I can't believe uh, how quick you know our program is coming to an end. So I want to thank you again for you. Uh, all that you have done and continue to do and will be doing you know, to advance uh, awareness and education and healing in our community with regards to not only AIDS, but also to our LGBT community. Um, and I'll just turn uh, the mic back to you. Would you like to share a few more words of wisdom with us and with anyone oh. who <laughs> Wisdom on the fly. Who is watching uh, I think, I think uh, the reason I stay at least peripherally involved is simply because uh, education's got to continue. The, the, the numbers are, are still growing. People being reinfected or infected by the virus that shouldn't be. It, it just no reason for anyone to get AIDS now. So uh, the education part of it, and, and again, uh, if you've got a few bucks left and can support the Life Foundation, uh, they do great work in age education. And uh, I would encourage anyone that, felt that, that has the time or money to volunteer and contribute and support the work of the Life Foundation. And uh, Paul Grossbeck uh, uh, is one of our unsung heroes. He's retiring now. He's been with the Life Foundation for many years. And he, he will be receiving an honor tonight, by the way, also. Paul Grosbeck, thank you. Thank you. Well, and that concludes uh, the end of our program for today. And uh, thank you so much for watching us. And I hope to see you back next Friday. Until then.